Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. As you heard, um, there's history in this topic. There's also math. There's maps. There's all kinds of stuff. It's a great topic. Any topic you like, any subject that drew you in when you were in school, you can dig into this further. We're going to skate across all of that. And then if there's some piece that you want to dig a little further, um, when we get to the questions, you can do that. Um, so there's going to be material here. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all the slides. We're going to kind of dash through because it's a very wonky topic. And, and you can spend hours digging into any piece of it. So people say lawsuits. And you could talk for hours about lawsuits or the math behind it, the data behind it, the maps behind it. We're going to start with vocabulary. Um, so there's three words you need to understand to really have a grasp of this. And the first one is reapportionment. So reapportionment happens by law. There are 435 seats in the House of Representatives. And those have to be divided across all the states. So as we know, population moves, population shifts. And historically, population in Pennsylvania relative to the rest of the country has gone down. So every there's a census every year that starts in zero. After that, the Congress gets the data, and then they have to redivide all those 435 seats across all the states. Pennsylvania historically loses a seat. A seat. We're pretty much guaranteed to lose a seat in the next reapportionment. So last time we had 19, we went to 18, we'll be going to 17. That's the first word you need to remember, reapportionment. It's really interesting to me. I'll hear even people who, who deal with this all the time will get these words mixed up. You listen to commentators, they'll get these words mixed up. Hold these tightly in your brain so you understand how this works. So reapportionment. Then the next word is redistricting. So once those seats are reapportioned to the, the states, then the states have to take the data and draw new maps. Because if we go from 19 to 18, you've got to redraw those maps. If you go from 18 to 17, which we will do again in 2020, you're going to have to redraw the maps. That's redistricting. So it happens at the congressional level, where you redraw those congressional districts, but also because population's moving around in the state, and now we have new data that shows that, then you have to redraw the state, Senate, and House maps as well. So there's three maps that get redrawn every 10 years. That's redistricting. And there's two different processes. I told you this is a wonky topic. I won't go too far. But um, the congressional districts are done as a, as a simple piece of legislation. It's handed to the legislature, and they vote on it. The governor signs it, and it's finished. The other maps, the state house and senate maps, are done by a five-person commission. So each party leader in each house chooses one person, usually another party leader in that house. And then those four people choose a fifth person. If they can't agree, and they never do, then the state Supreme Court chooses the fifth person. Now this leads us to, and, and there's, a, there's, some, there's some requirements on this. The state constitution says about the, the legislative districts, they should be compact and contiguous, and they should not divide more than necessary county, city, incorporated town, borough, township, or ward. That's for the state legislative districts. We'll see how that plays out. But this brings us to our third word, which is gerrymandering. So gerrymandering is the manipulation of those maps for advantage. And that can be for partisan advantage for your party, can be for personal advantage for particular people. In Pennsylvania, it's always both. And the first um, to, to be the first, the use of the name came from Elbridge Gerry, governor of Massachusetts, who Tom mentioned earlier. In 1812, there was a map drawn to benefit his party, the Democratic Republicans. So when people say the Democrats started, or the Republicans, you can say no, it was the Democratic Republicans. Um, but they drew a map that looked like a salamander to keep their party in power in Massachusetts. Elbridge Gerry signed it. The papers were having a field day with this. And somebody coined the term the gerrymander because it looked like a salamander. So that term has been around ever since. Gerrymandering, it's a conflict of interest. And really, there's no other democracy in the world that allows legislators any role in drawing the maps. It's kind of like letting a football team decide who the ref is going to be, where the starting line is going to be, and set up the rules for the next 10 years based on their own team advantage. That's kind of what it's like. It's a conflict of interest. We believe it shouldn't be that way. And we're the only democracy that allows it. There is one other democracy. Yeah, let, me, let me be clear, Malaysia. Other than that, it's not allowed in other democracies. Now, to understand how this works, think of you have a population set a certain way, and you can, oh, 
I'm working off my, I'm so sorry. I'm working off two computers. And I have, how do I do this? Somebody's going to have to show me. I've been assuming you're seeing what I'm seeing because I usually work off my computer and, and I'm, I'm not showing. Okay, so let me run really fast. Reapportionment. So we lose a seat um, and we're one of the, there's not a lot of states that lose seats. We're one. Let me do this. I've got lots of technology going on. I'm redistricting. So there we are. There's two different processes and there's the constitutional requirements. And there's our friend Elbridge Jerry. Now you can see him and you can see his beautiful salamander. There he is. Okay? Now, this is where we really need to start seeing the visuals. Um, how does gerrymandering work? Now assume you've got a population where you've got 60% blue, 40% red. You can draw the lines in lots of different ways. What's the right way to draw the lines? Well, you could draw them the second way there, which is you end up with three blue districts and two red districts. So that's fair, right? Proportionately fair for the population you have. In some ways that's great, in some ways it's not great, because what you end up with is, is that party dominates that district always forever, and so the only real election is in the primary. So that's a particular kind of way that you can draw the lines. If you take this next one, if the blue folks are in charge of drawing the lines, they can just draw in a way that they get all the seats completely. Okay, that's gerrymandering. Um, or if the red are in charge and they're smart, they can draw so that they get an advantage. They can't get all the seats, but they can get three out of five. They get a majority through gerrymandering. Okay, so this is a really classic one. This has been all over the place. Um, mo many of you have already seen it. I don't particularly like that because to me that makes everybody kind of like a checker piece and we're people. And so some of us are people with strong opinions, not so strong. There's independents, there's green folks. Now assume you have a popular, I'm gonna get this down. I'm gonna, okay, so assume we're people, not, not checker pieces, and there's different kinds of people. So assume you have a population like that. If you drew the lines like that, who would your candidates have to appeal to? Everybody, right? They'd have to be problem solvers. They'd have to come forward with some solutions. They'd have to be people who listen to constituents, know what matters to constituents, and convince a majority of constituents that they have a solution, right? This is probably the most important slide in my whole thing. Remember this. This isn't about party against party. It's not about red versus blue. This is about whose voices are heard. So if you draw the lines right, everybody has to say, and the politician has to appeal to everyone. Now, there's a form of gerrymandering called the sweetheart gerrymander, and this is on the right. This is both parties sit down and say, mm, we don't like having to appeal to everybody. I would prefer to have a safe seat. Wouldn't you prefer to have a safe seat? Let's draw it so we have safe seats. So you can draw it so that you have a red seat, a blue seat. Now, in my example, you end up with a swing seat, in Pennsylvania, that really doesn't happen. Our Pennsylvania politicians are much smarter than that. They've managed to really draw those swing seats completely <coughs> away. And I have to tell you, my own state senator, when I talked to him about this, he said, gerrymandering's not a problem because my colleague, who is of the other party, we sit down and we divide the neighborhoods and it's very friendly. Well, basically, they've both been in office a very long time, and neither one of them really listens to constituents. And constituents know that. And as a constituent, I was appalled. I said. That doesn't sound like democracy to me. He shrugged. That's the way it works here. Um, there's a couple other forms of gerrymandering. One is called cracking. And cracking is when you take a community and divide it out so that it doesn't really have any power. Um, and if you look at our small cities across Pennsylvania, you'll see an incredible amount of cracking going on. That's in congressional districts, Senate districts. This happens to be house districts. Um, so I don't know if you know anything about Beaver Falls, this is just an example that I find particularly horrifying. It's, a, it's an urban area, Beaver Falls, and it's divided into, into four, four house districts with the, all this weirdness going on. And the effect of that is that community loses its voice. Instead of having its own representative, it's a kind of immaterial piece of four other districts. That's cracking. Packing um, happens around our larger cities. So that's where you um, kind of loop out and pull in constituents that, that the opposition doesn't want kind of watering down or making competitive the districts around them. So Philadelphia, 
Um, District 1 has historically been Philadelphia. Dis District 1 keeps wandering out further and further into, this, into the county next to it, Delaware County, because Delaware County becomes more and more a swing county. And so to keep it from being a swing county, you just kind of loop in those folks and keep, keep them with the Democrats in Philadelphia. So that's packing. This is probably the, notor the most historic um, in Pennsylvania. It, well, if you look at lists of the worst gerrymandered districts in the country, District 7 always ends up on the list. There it is. And some people call it uh, Goofy Kicking Donald. I've heard Goofy Kicking Mickey Mouse. Um, somebody calls it Bullwinkle. You know, Bullwinkle with the antlers. You can kind of see that. Or Spin Art. I kind of like the Spin Art one. Anyhow, people make up names for these. And, and they think about the shapes, but it's not so much the shape, it's the story there. And I was talking to uh, Tom sitting next to me. He's in District 6. Uh, so District 6, you can see it runs all the way over there into Lebanon. I'm also in District 6. So that's where Tom lives. I'll show you where I live. We're in the same we're in the same district, and if you look at look at Lancaster, your district 16 part of you is district 16, running from Reading down through Lancaster, up into Chester County Horse Country, ending up in Coatesville. There's a reason for all that. Anybody know? Well, you take a, a, so Montgomery County is probably one of the most swing counties in the country. It's very purple in terms of demography. Montgomery County by number should have one congressman plus some. And instead of having one congressman, it's divided into five congressional districts and none of them live in Montgomery County. Amazing, genius. Completely dilutes any voice that Montgomery County has. Burks, well, Reading is, is the poorest, the last census, Reading was the poorest community in the country, the last census. Most underfunded school district in the country. Is there anybody really representing Reading? Who is, who is you know, when you think, and I'm not talking against any legislator, they're all wonderful people. Um, the system behind it is a problem. So when you look at it, Reading is voting with Lancaster, is voting with very, very wealthy West Chester, West Chester County horse country, is voting with Coatesville, another very poor minority community. Who is being represented and who is not in this beautiful, I call this the trifecta. To me, these are three genius districts that accomplish a great deal for the people who drew them and accomplish nothing at all for the people who live in them. And it's not just our, you can go across the state, and I've spoken now in 15, this might be my 16th county, I think it is, um, 16 counties, and everywhere I go, I look at the maps and I say, oh my goodness, look at what they did. So Erie County historically had one congressional district, the only district in Pennsylvania on the Great Lake, so the only representative in Washington, thinking about Great Lake economy, Great Lake environmental issues, they got rid of that, they divided Erie into two congressional districts, and it's now an afterthought for both of those districts. So they're con neither of those congressmen is particularly interested in the Great Lake issues. And this happens across the state, happened to Lehigh Valley. Look at any of our congressional districts and think, who benefits from this? There is a politician who benefits from it, and the party perhaps benefits from it, but do the people benefit from it? Not at all. But there's another piece to this, not just the, the benefit of having districts drawn to advantage particular politicians or party, but also to hold politicians in line in both parties. So this is a, I was actually with Senator Lisa Vascoli yesterday, she's a prime sponsor of a bill that we support, um, and she was talking about how pervasive it is that party leaders on both sides use the redistricting process to punish legislators who attempt to represent their people. So she was describing some situations in the Lehigh Valley. This is a situation that happened out in the western part of the state. There was a, a Democratic representative who insisted on voting in a way that he believed his constituents wanted him to. His leadership said, don't do it again. He did. So if you look at that, he was the representative for District 29 in Ross Township. Do you see District 29 there? 
vanished. They moved it to the other side of the state, redrew it completely in 2001, um, and Ross Township, which had had one representative representing them as well as he could do, was carved into four districts. So who was punished? The legislator or the people of Ross Township? Or all of us? And I would say all of us. When our democracy is held hostage by a few people using the power of the pen to enforce their will on legislators and population, all of us are harmed. Now this is your county. Uh, and I, I'm still trying to get my hands around, my brain around what's going on in your county. Your county is one of, in congressional districts, you've got that crazy trifecta thing I showed you. Your Senate districts are, are kind of okay. Your House districts, I'd love someone to explain what's going on here because you are one of the most uh, carved up counties in the state in terms of how many, how many representatives you have and you've got these districts that slide out into the counties around you in ways that you become an afterthought in them. And you also are one of the counties in the state that has the most carved up townships. So in other words, your townships, rather than be the central focus of representatives, are divided out into several. And that happens with Mannheim Township, Lancaster Township, um, there's a number of your townships. And you could, I'm sure you could go through the map much better than I could and say, aha, I know why that was done. I know why that was done. And we're just starting a campaign with Fair Districts PA, which I represent, inviting people to know your maps. We have a, a page on our website, um, fairdistrictspa.com, and there's a page that has district maps, and you can just zoom in and look and see what's going on there, why was it drawn that way, who benefits, who is harmed. Now, gerrymandering's been around a long time, and you heard um, 1812. Elbridge Jerry, um, but it's changed. So this is the evolution of District 7. Does it look a little different? Something's happened to our wonderful practice of gerrymandering, and what's happened is mapping technology, think what you can do with maps that you couldn't do a decade or 20 years ago. Data mining technology, think about the information about you that's available to everyone. Um, when, how often you vote, um, party registration, um, education level, income level, what you watch on TV, all of that data is available out there and all that data right now is used. When, when the legislators sit down and start carving up neighborhoods, they can predict with great precision, block by block by block, how, how a voting block will work, will vote, and so then they can carve it up very precisely to control and to predict and control the outcome of our elections. In 2010, Carl Rove um, had a genius idea. Um, he realized that whoever controls the redistricting process can control Congress. Because redistricting happens at the state legislative level, but that decides how many seats each party gets in Congress. And he realized that if the Republican Party took control of this process in specific states, they could get more legislators in Congress, which is a great thing to do. Not so much for the people, sure, you want your party to be victorious, but let's take a step back and think. If you are a, a national or international um, industry, you want to be able to control what kind of regulation gets put in place, <clears throat> what kind of trade gets put in place. You want to be able to control all that. So what happened was a great deal of outside money was put into specific states in a project called Red Map 2010. And this is all, I, I was actually, uh, a year or so ago, I was doing a lot of research and digging around on the internet, and I came across this and I thought, wait, is this, this is here, it's visible, it's, they bragged about putting money into specific states so that they could capture the process, so that they could control Congress. And this website talks about putting some money into legislative House and Senate races outside money coming into those races simply to capture those, simply to be able to control the redistricting process in, in, Cong in Harrisburg to get more districts. So what happened in Pennsylvania, we're, we're a pretty even state. We're a very swing state. We're slightly more Democrats than Republicans by registration, but they're clustered. So you would expect our, our distribution of congressmen to be about even. We've got 18. By rights, it should be about 9, 9, or 10, 8, something like that. 
Republicans got 13 and Democrats got five. And Red Map 2010 will tell you it's because of that outside money that was invested here to make that happen. So what's gonna happen in 2020? This is gonna escalate. So there's now, as far as I can count, four Democratic organizations thinking about this. Um, Advantage 2020 put their website up two years ago. Notice that, that district there, the green one? That's our District 7. Uh, Unrig the Map is the other one, um, where they're looking at states where the governor has a play in the way this is done. Notice the four states that are their top target. Pennsylvania is one of those. And then there's the um, National Democratic Redistricting Committee. I've been told just this past couple weeks that Pennsylvania is their top target in terms of putting money to capture this process. And there's something called Organizing for Action, which is the Obama grassroots effort that's now being repurposed to work on gerrymandering issues. So as far as I can count, that's four Democratic issues groups with Pennsylvania as the top of their focus. And then, of course, there's the Red Map 2020, because it worked so well in 2010, there's a lot of money that's going to go into it going on into the future. And we're going to be the target of that. So why is that? Well, because we are losing a, a seat, so that means our congressional districts will be very much redrawn. We're also one of the few remaining large swing states left. The only others are Florida and Illinois. Florida's the largest. We're the next largest. And we have almost no protections against outside money in terms of campaign finance. So lots of outside money will be coming in from now until 2020, but a lot right at the last moment to, to flip your district. So whatever your legislator is doing, whether you like them or not, there's gonna be all those really ugly mailers. This is how it works six weeks before the election. The really toxic mailers with all kinds of crazy accusations will suddenly show up in your mailbox and too late for the person that they're talking about to have any kind of organized response. It undermines our democracy, it undermines the tone of our democracy, it puts our legislators at great risk, and this game will continue unless we change it. Now, according to every measure I've seen, Jerry, Pennsylvania is one of the most gerrymandered in the country. Um, by some standards, we're the worst, by some standards, we're the next worst, um, and I won't go into that. If you love math and data, this is a fun place to dig around. Um, I'm not gonna go there because it gets way into the weeds, but we are very gerrymandered, and that has lots of implications. So for instance, um, very little choice at the polls. Most of our seats are assigned. I mean, when you talk to people who are involved in this, they say, oh, that was Pat Meehan's district. I mean, it was drawn for him. These seats are assigned, um, the, the, and I'm not saying anything against him. I'm just saying that the way the thought is that the districts are drawn for particular people, they are assigned to particular parties. There's no reason in the world for the other party to even bother putting a, a, a candidate in place. 86% um, of our legislative races last time around had no opposition in the primary. It was going to be 57% had would, were going to have no opposition in the general election, but there were several write-ins who kind of jumped in at the last minute, so it was 48.7. The truth is, most of that 48.7 had no chance at all. They were not serious candidates. They were either write-in candidates or there were people who said, I'll just run for office, but I'm not going to bother putting up a website. I'm not going to put any money into it because I don't have a chance because this is an assigned district. We already know who it belongs to, and it will belong to them forever unless they decide to resign or some other tragedy happens to them. There's a, um, a study that's really important if politics is of interest to you um, that was done recently by Catherine Gale and Michael Porter. Michael Porter is with the Harvard Competitiveness Project and they were looking at the economic implications of this because it's not just that we're not well represented. There are huge financial implications to dysfunctional government which is what we have. If you have legislators who don't need to listen to constituents, if you have legislators who are assured of their incumbency without ever having to pass a bill or solve a problem, then you get what we have in Harrisburg, which is gridlock, which is credit ratings going down, which is a great inability to come up with a balanced budget that makes sense to anybody who knows anything about financial management, that's where we are. And so they were looking at what is, what is, what is causing the, the gridlock in, in, they were looking specifically at DC, but I think everything that they came across translates very well back to Pennsylvania. 
And what they basically found was we have a system that's set up, deliberately set up, to protect incumbents, to protect the two-party system, and to shut out the voices of voters. And the system will not be self-correcting. In other words, there needs to be some outside pressure, some outside force, and some intervention to return to something that looks more like a real representative democracy. And I just realized that's the slide that I'm supposed to be at. Um, so a functional, a healthy political system would be offering real solutions to real problems, would have broad buy-in by a majority of citizens, would respect the Constitution and the rights of citizens. And right now, we're not seeing that, either in DC or in Harrisburg. And then we begin to think, well, dysfunction is just the way it is. That's just, that's just par for the course. But if you talk to people who've been in Harrisburg for any length of time, they'll tell you it is much worse than it used to be. And in fact, it used to work. It used to work. It used to be the two parties balanced out. They collaborated. They sat down and solved problems. They were able to function together and come to real solutions. So as I was talking with Lisa Bus, Senator Boscola yesterday, and she was saying it, it, it's gotten much, much worse, and it's getting worse by the day. And if we don't fix gerrymandering, it will get even further worse. That doesn't sound right. It'll get it'll get continue to get worse. So it's broken. We have a broken system, and I'm going to run out of time. So I'm going to I'm going to just run along really fast. Um, less moderates, less, bi less bipartisan solutions. Um, in Pennsylvania, we are one of the worst. So by any measure, I said we're one of the most gerrymandered. We're also, on any electoral integrity measure that you give, we are among the, the five worst states. And you see that showing up in our economy. You see that showing up in our credit rating. Um, there was a study that basically looked at what impact citizens have in the way that policy is enacted and said the average citizen has a, has a um, minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. In some states, that's not true. In some states, citizens have a huge impact. In Pennsylvania, citizens have almost no way of impacting anything. I was, this morning, I was at a, um, a breakfast in Reading. Um, put on by the Pennsylvania Economy League. And they're looking at the fiscal distress of boroughs, townships, cities in Pennsylvania. And they say it's bad and it's getting rapidly worse. Um, it was a rather sobering um, conversation. And they, they've looked at ways that townships, boroughs, municipalities can do better. And they've come to the conclusion, 10 years ago they came to the conclusion, that unless the state legislature intervenes in a whole host of ways, it will just keep getting worse. Because the codes, the zoning, the regulations, all of the things that govern life in our boroughs, townships, municipalities, were all put in place over half a century ago, when people actually lived, worked, shopped, in their towns. That doesn't happen anymore, and our, our regulatory framework doesn't reflect the current realities of our state. And because of that disconnect, the financial implications are dire. They said repeatedly, the system is broken, and the economic consequences of legislative inaction are costly and pervasive. So what do we do? Um, we started a group called Fair Districts PA back in January of 2016. Uh, League of Women Voters, Common Cause Pennsylvania, a number of other groups, Pennsylvania, um, Council of Churches, um, Committee of 70 from Philly, a whole bunch of groups sat down and said, our legislative process, our legislative electoral process is broken. And how do we intervene? What can we do? We started this organization to look at a way to um, get rid of gerrymandering because we think that's not, Ending gerrymandering is not the silver bullet that will fix our democracy completely, but it would restore a level of responsiveness and accountability to the way that the process works. So um, we came together, we agreed that we would work as hard as we could for an independent citizens redistricting commission. Um, Senator Boscola introduced a bill, Senate Bill 22 in January of 2017. Um, the same bill was introduced by Representative Steve Samuelson and Eric Rowe in May of 2017, and we are working as hard as we can to get the legislators to look at those bills, to understand the importance of them, to buy in with them. Now, people say, why in the world would any legislator give up the power that they have, right? They have the power of the pen, and they're doing this. In truth, they don't. So the, the bill that became our Congressional Districts Act 161, the legislators were given a document. They're supposed to get three read-throughs and then vote. The first read through it said, District 1 will be a parcel of land in Pennsylvania. 
No detail, no wording, no map, no nothing. Second read through, District 1 will be a parcel of land in Pennsylvania. They had no, there's no transparency, no way to vet it out, no way to see. How does this impact my people? The third document they were given actually had the language that you know, said where the lines would be drawn, but they didn't have a map, they couldn't look at it, and they were given just hours and told by leadership on both sides, vote for this. So many legislators were quite unhappy when they actually finally got to see the maps and realized what had been done. They were alarmed. Um, but then in the House and Senate, remember, the legislative leaders use this to control. And many legislators would love to be free to represent their people, and they would love to have districts that made sense so that they could get to know communities, know what the communities needed, and represent those communities instead of feeling like they're scattered and trying to represent bits and pieces of different agendas. So there's, we have 98 at the moment, 98 sponsors on the House bill. We're four away from a simple majority. Uh, the commission that we're supporting uh, would be a constitutional amendment, and I don't have time for details, but it would create a commission that would be drawn from pools of candidates who are not political, not elected officials, whether they're spouses or lobbyists or staffers or party officials. Um, they'd be independent people who don't have a personal investment in this. There'd be a commission of 11, four from each major party, three from minor parties or unaffiliated, and they would not be allowed to use any partisan data. So it would be a transparent process with public input. Every piece of information used would be available on a website. Anybody could take that information and draw their own maps and see what that looks like. Um, and there would be none of this kind of back room, back and forth that currently exists. Some people say, well, litigation is a solution, and there are two, uh, there's a, a big national lawsuit that came out of Wisconsin. I don't have time to go into details on it, but by the, the standard that's applied in that, Wisconsin um, is the bottom, this bottom line is Wisconsin, um, their efficiency gap, which shows the level of gerrymandering. Pennsylvania is by far the worst by the standard that's being used in the Supreme Court case that's being heard right now. It's been heard. We're still waiting for the decision. Um, and so what's happened in Pennsylvania is two cases are going to be decided within weeks. Um, there was, last week was a huge week for litigation on this in Pennsylvania. Thursday, uh, we heard that the League of Women Voters case would be expedited and has to be resolved by the end of December. The next day, we heard that the other case, brought by five individuals, they have a week, the legislative leaders have a week to disclose all the emails, all the correspondence, and all the details about the process that was used the last time around to draw our congressional districts. So this is going to be an exciting week going forward. All of that information will be disclosed by Friday. So expect there to be more news on this soon. Oh, I'm going the wrong. Wait. Yes, so there's the, the cases that are coming forward, and I won't go into details on those either. Um, going back to that study, they, the, the question is how, how, how can citizens engage on this? Um, and, and the truth is, the amendments that we're putting forward will not move forward unless there's a huge groundswell of support. There are legislators in favor, but in terms of the leadership giving up power, they will never give up power unless we find ways to influence them and convince them that they have to. Um, and that brings us back to you, um, to, to people who have influence, people who are thoughtful, people who know people. Um, how do we leverage what we know, who we are, to accomplish this change? So Gail and Porter, who wrote that study, they're kind of going around the country saying, we need business communities, we need um, professional associations, we need citizens with influence to rethink their engagement and to realize that unless we all re-engage to reclaim democracy and make it work, it's just going to keep getting worse. And that has huge economic implications for all of us. So in Ohio, um, yeah, yeah, uh, let me just, uh, I'm almost done. So in Ohio, manufacturers and AFL-CIO are working together on this. In Dakota, farmers, um, we've put groups together across the state and had public meetings. Um, we've had resolutions, um, and in Lancaster County, you've had a number of resolutions passed by local townships. And I just wanted to end with a quote from our uh, President Ronald Reagan on gerrymandering. 
Um, and there it is.